Welcome back, Equity Warriors. Thanks for tuning in. I know for many of you in North America, it's the middle of the workday, but not to worry. If you ever miss a live stream, you will still get the edited podcast via your regular audio platform, as well as on my YouTube channel. And if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel at Almitra Berry, just do that now. Click on that subscribe button, hit the notifications button, be the first to get every single show because you don't want to miss a single one. My guest today is Heather Wiederstein. Heather is an accomplished ed tech professional with nearly 20 years of experience in writing, designing, and developing learner-focused educational software. She has a background as a certified classroom teacher and a keen eye for developing software that truly meets the needs of learners. Throughout her career, Heather has delivered award-winning software solutions in literacy and early childhood education at prestigious organizations like Pearson, Teaching Strategies, and Learning Ally. Currently, she serves as an advisor and consultant for ed tech companies, offering her expertise in innovation, pedagogy, and product development to help companies achieve their goals and improve child outcomes. Heather, welcome to the show. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm glad to be here. Me too. And I'm so happy that we actually have this topic in June in sort of in honor and celebration of Gay Pride Month. Today, we're going to be talking about the intersectionality of black and brown communities and queer identity. So before we dig into that, um, A, I want to let folks know I am going to do a deep dive, more like a professional learning session on intersectionality this summer. So if you're subscribed, you'll get a notification when that releases. But I want people to understand intersectionality and how it is so important, not just to black and brown communities, um, but particularly to black and brown people that also have queer identity. And in the broader sense, what is this whole intersectionality thing? So Kimberly Crenshaw is a black feminist scholar, and she's the one who really did the, the foundational work on intersectionality and actually coined the phrase. Her work was focused on activism and women of color, so feminism and race-based social movements. But we look at intersectionality from a broader perspective. It's been expanded, right? So we're talking about racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia. And because there is this interconnection between influence, power, privilege, and oppression, that intersectional experience for people who identify as multiple things. So I'm a Black woman, two identities, um, that there is oppression for both of those. And the sum of that racism and oppression or racism and sexism is greater than each as an individual, right? Heather, multiple identities? (laughs) Yes. Uh, so I identify as a lesbian. I'm also a woman. And so, you know, those, those two um, parts of my identity intersect and uh, multiply as well. And, you know, I can only speak, I can only speak to those lived experiences as a woman and, uh, and as a lesbian and not as a woman of color. Right. But that makes us a great combo for this podcast, yes. doesn't it? I think we've got most of the bases covered. I was so excited to be able to have this conversation with you as we were planning for it. I thought it was, uh, uh, it's, I, I'm pleased to be able to be in the conversation as well. All right, cool. So um, I want to talk about how racism and queer identity am, interact. Um, I'll take the racism side if you take the queer identity side and I can speak as, you know, sort of the general, what a lot of black folks say, um, and you get the other the other side of that. And we really need a brown person on here as well to give us some more, maybe somebody that's listening um, who identifies as a uh, Latine, um, Central or South American, wants to come on the show, just give me a call. Find me, a, DM me on whatever platform and, and let's chat. So historically, these communities, Black and brown communities, queer communities have been marginalized. Um, And I think historically, we've also seen our struggle or our fights separately. What do you see in your community? Yeah, I think one of the things that is optimistic for me is that I am seeing more conversations around that intersectionality. I think early efforts for LGBTQ rights were very separate. They were very much uh, privileged white gay men and lesbians. Um, and I think those conversations, I hope those conversations, at least the ones I'm, I'm part of, are, are starting to change and become more inclusive because we can't truly 
progress if if we're just doing it for subsections or some part of, of our identity. Yeah. Um, and there's a danger, I certainly, and I want people to understand, no one person can speak for a whole community. If you were to ask me, what do Black people think? I can only tell you what this Black person thinks. And some of my friends and, and family that I have conversations with, um, there's also that danger in, you know, asking you, what do people who identify as LGBTQ, what do they think, right? Or what do white women think? Because, thank God, they don't all think alike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, no one would ever mistake you for a Karen, that is for sure. I've, I've gotten to know you that well. If you were a Karen, you probably wouldn't be on the show in a friendly banter. Um, this would not be happening. Well, I'll take that as a compliment. Please do. Please do. <laughs> so I know just growing up and so, you know, um, maybe sort of that middle of the road, mainstream, um, church going black folks, there's always been this within our own community, demonizing people who had queer identity. And I hope that's the right, I'm using the right term, is sort of all encompassing. Um, I remember as a child, um, a neighbor uh, who was a drag queen on the weekends, and we were told not to talk to him, don't go around him. He was harmless. I mean, he's a great guy because he did everybody's wigs. He was a hairdresser. Um, so he did everyone's wigs, but we were told, you know, don't talk to him on, you know, when he comes out looking or comes out on Saturday night because that was when the change happened. And I remember a classmate in high school um, who was struggling with queer identity and he had several brothers and he came up to campus one day in drag and they just beat the crap out of him. And it, it just broke my heart that, you know, within his own family, he couldn't be accepted. So, you know, not accepted for that part of his identity and still in a period of time, I mean, we are still in a period of time when black people are judged based on the color of their skin, even though we say, um, or so many people say they don't see color. I have an issue with that statement, but I won't go there. So what have you seen? Yeah, I certainly, um, even in, you know, I think about these concentric circles, right? So we have our, our families of origin mm -hmm. that we grew up in, and we have that experience in terms of um, uh, coming out or wondering about acceptance or receiving acceptance. Um, I have, and, and by the way, uh, for me, in our conversation, queer works. I, I To your point, I can't speak for, for all folks, but... Um, uh, you know, referring to my understanding of my part of my community, uh, queer works. Okay. Um, I have other queer members of my family of, of birth. And um, uh, I came out later in life. Uh, I had a male cousin who came out much earlier. Um, his, the way that he was accepted was very different and not at all as supportive as the way it was accepted um, when I came out. And so, you know, even among uh, the gay and lesbian or the queer um, uh, sort of framework in my own family, it was okay that a woman was, but it was not okay uh, that a man was because that meant something about his manliness or about, uh, you know, some definition of what it means to be a man in my particular family. Right? And then you, you expand that into the neighborhood that you grow up in. Mm -hmm. And we were in a pretty rough working class neighborhood that um, uh, I think would have preferred to suppress any sort of expression of those identities growing up. Um, and you just keep kind of expanding that and you have that experience of worrying or wondering how I'm going to be accepted. How many times do I have to come out? How many times do I have to deal with um, someone else's receiving of my, my lived experience? So I guess maybe trying to wrap my head around all of this. Um, one, I'm hearing the different experience in terms of intersectionality at least in your family of origin for being queer and male versus being queer and female, right? So there's that that piece there. Um, I know that within the Black community and broader community, not just my nuclear family, um, but the neighborhood I grew up in, the church I attended, school systems, et cetera, mm -hmm. that coming out as gay um, or lesbian 
was not accepted in, definitely not accepted in the church that I grew up in. Um, and I would see, you know, neighboring churches or other ones that I, that I visited. And my husband and I, um, and my husband is a PK, a preacher's kid, um, so really grew up in the church, um, completely not accepted. But we see all the time, or we sort of joke that we wouldn't have um, ministers of music or choir directors in the Black Baptist churches um, were it not for gay Black men. Um, but we tend to still want to put these blinders on. And I think what concerns me or or scares me, worries me about our children in our schools is that they're struggling with all these different identities and things that are going on around them. Um, and as a person of color, um, you can't conceal that outer shell. You can't, you know, I, I will joke with, with um, when I do workshops, I say, you know, when I walked in the room, you clearly identified me as a person of color um, and probably with the, you know, the hair and the makeup and the dress and the high heels, which I'm trying not to wear so much anymore, not good for the feet, um, but that I am a female, a woman of color. And if I stood here and identified myself with my 23% Scotch Irish, according to my DNA, you might look at me a little bit funny because you see me, right? I can't conceal that. And so I, 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 I worry about our kids that are trying to conceal a piece of their identity. And if that's the queer side, but they're also struggling with being a person of color and the oppression that's there, that what does it do in terms of their, their mindset and their mental health and struggling with, I've already got this piece of oppression and I can see that if I come out, I've got this other one layered on top of it. Yeah, I think when I listen to that, I think about our, how we started this conversation with intersectionality. And I, I um, imagine a young black queer boy uh, in a school environment, right? Uh, how, how much of his identity is he allowed to be accepted for um, in society at large? And, and as that's kind of filtrating into the ways that we're handling school policy right now. And, uh, even, even as a, a black boy, um, yeah. that might be the part of his identity that he's allowed to, to express and allowed to celebrate and, uh, and is accepted for, but even that is not the same privilege and confidence and authority to walk through the halls of his own school as his white straight male counterpart. Yeah. 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 And so, I think, you know, I think, it, you know, I think about my cousin and how he suppressed so much of himself to to be accepted in his own family and then in his school and then in his larger community and what a toll that took on him. And he's a white man. If he were walking down the street, he would be largely viewed as an every man, right? Like yeah. the kind of yeah. guy that we're going to go have a beer with. Right, right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, he's still a white guy. You know, that's who we see when we see him. Yeah. Um. When we first started chatting, we we really got yeah we we go down so many different directions. I sure. love it when when we can talk. But um, one of the things that is impacting both communities in our schools is this whole book ban bullshit. Sorry, because um, that's what it is. Um, so let's talk about how these book bans are impacting marginalized communities as a whole. And for folks who are listening, if you haven't already listened, um, my episode five, uh, Confronting and Teaching Hard History, really digs into that um, and then put into more of a right now context, episode 38, when did book bans become a bigger threat than bullets? We are have this insane focus on not letting children read books that are diverse, but we're bringing guns into school and kids are dying every single week in our classrooms from bullets. Nobody's died from reading a book, but we've got, um, and I know you've got more, more numbers. So I'll say we have 17 states that have book bans period. And you've got some other numbers about states. What are yours? Yeah. So I have some, some numbers uh, and, and, I'm happy to be wrong if my numbers aren't as up to date as possible. I did get some from uh, the Human Rights Campaign 
which does update their, their data pretty frequently. But um, there are also uh, the, the book bans um, are symptomatic of a larger part of society, right? And I know you've talked about this. So uh, I'm going to include some of that, that larger oh, dialogue and narrative uh, that is harmful. So, you know, some people might say, what does it matter if we're banning books in school? Their parents can read to them. Well, it matters because that same narrative that called a, a book with a gay character pornography to have it removed from the shelf uh, is the same narrative that now has 17 states that have banned gender affirming care for non-binary and trans children. Uh, the parents have approved, have supported, have sought out uh, highly qualified medical care uh, that are now being uh, not just demonized, but actually criminally prosecuted in some cases for providing gender affirming care to their own children. There are 16 more states considering that same type of legislation. So yes, I love this idea. And I, you know, you and I've talked about Dr. Rudy and Sims and her, her concept of windows, mirrors, and sliding glass mm -hmm. doors. I love this idea that we want children to see themselves yeah. in their books. We want children to see their neighbors in their books. And they want, yeah. we want children to meet people they've never met before through their books. Um, but even more than that, we want those, we want that representation um, as a safety mechanism. We were just starting to make strides with uh, LGBTQ rights and trans rights, mm -hmm. excuse me. And, and it's, you know, this really does feel like two steps back. Suicide yeah. rates among trans children were dropping. And I think, uh, you know, I don't have those statistics, but I believe we're going to see a bump up in that again. Um, and so, you, you know, that's, that's something. And you talk about how uh, books have never killed a kid. Neither has a drag queen. A drag <laughs> queen reading a story has never murdered a child, right? And there are, no. there are 15 states that are considering banning drag story hour, not allowing a person who wants to read, to tell a story to a child, to engage mm -hmm. with a child in a ben completely benign way. And, uh, and whose parents want them to see that, right? Absolutely. So it's, this isn't happening in schools. These are, you know, people who volunteer and they take their kids yeah. to see these shows. I had numbers about the suicide rate. I'm, I'm kind of hunting for them on the side, but keep going. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, uh, and to your point, yes, these are parents, 70%, in a recent poll, 70% of parents were against banning books. Yeah. Uh, so why why are we banning books? It's a very, it's a very vocal minority. So in terms of the drag story time, um, you know, the narrative there is that, we are trying to sexualize drag story time does not sexualize children no. books with lgbtqia characters and themes do not present sexual content to children no. um, they are not pornography these are books that provide representation that look like myself my family my community my church all of those concentric circles of my belonging can be represented and should be represented because, you know, just per I feel like I'm rambling now, but just personally, no. it, it took me 30 years to deal with my own identity as a queer woman because church, society, family reaction, um, and not seeing the representation. I can go yeah. on Netflix, I can find a show about lesbian storylines in, in three clicks. Yeah. When I was growing up as a teenager, Ellen kissed someone on a on a sitcom, and that was the first time that had ever been seen. Yeah, and she got canceled for it. Yeah, yeah, and now it's it's every show and almost every episode. Um, so we're talking. If you take my seventeen states in general that have book bans, and another was it fifteen or sixteen? You said banning 16. gender affirming care sixteen. Yeah. Um, so if my math is correct, that gives us uh, a majority of the states, um, more than thirty states. Uh, thirty. What? Thirty. Thirty-five. Thirty. Thirty-three. I always say I don't do math. I do math. I'm just. I, I was an yeah, English 33. major. Thirty-three. Okay. <laughs> 
as a political science major, there we go. We can't count. In terms of titles, and this goes to um, somebody actually left a, a note on, on LinkedIn today and said that we are, are rapidly approaching an Orwellian 1984 society, 2,500 plus titles that have been banned. And when I did the last uh, episode 38, um, one of the books that I was, you know, it just makes no sense to me. It's not just about the storylines. So let's go 2,500 titles. 40% of those titles are about people of color as a primary or secondary character. 40% of those are about characters that are LGBTQ and 20% address race and racism. So, you know, being queer or being of color is some humongous threat. But when we look at the number of children in our schools who are of color, they are rapidly becoming the majority population. Um, the fastest growing population of learners we have right now are emergent bilingual learners, right? So these are kids coming from other countries, mostly Central and South America, that do not speak English as a primary language. And yet, we're going to take out books of people that look like them, that mirror, that reflection of their culture, of, of their appearance, of their experience. Um, and whenever I talk about that, there's there's a book I read to my sixth graders when I taught sixth grade called Lupita Manana. And it was the story of these two kids. And I did it as read aloud to my sixth graders um, who every day wanted to sit. They were so cute um, for sixth graders. They were so cute. They wanted to sit on the carpet. It was story time. And they just got wrapped into the story of this little girl and her brother who were making the journey um, on foot to the United States and dealing with coyotes and, and, and hiding in places. Um, but that story that resonated with the lived experience of the kids that were in my classroom and their family members. Um, and I think I, that I'm, I'm going to venture a guess it's probably banned. Um, a book about Roberto Clemente has been banned. I'm like, we're banning books about America's pastime because it's about a person of color. Um, I'm a huge Astros fan. Go Astros. We're coming back. We're going to take that pennant again this year. Um, and I look at that team and it is overwhelmingly black and brown. I think the primary language on that team is Spanish because the majority of our players do come from Central America, um, Central America, the Caribbean, Spanish speaking countries. But we so we are ignoring the fact that it's a very small percentage of people who want these books out. And I think they literally are just taking a look at a cover or a title or whatever and saying, no, it fits that category and throwing it out. I, I, can I, can I tell a, a, a so, you yeah. know, you know, I recently came from a literacy organization and we had a huge library of books when this started. Of course, we had to become very aware of it. We had mm -hmm. 80,000 books in a library, right? So of course, we were going to have to deal with this. We had somebody, a customer who wrote to us and said, a parent did a search of the word sex and found 800 titles. We need to get rid of every book that has the word sex in the title. So we, you want us to get rid of The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, which has nothing to do- Nothing to do with sexuality. With sex. Yeah. 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 You know, and let, sex let's call is a, it, also a word for gender, right? You know, biological. Yes. Biological. Yeah. So, but let's call a spade a spade. Um, the same people who will pull the Roberto Clemente book will mm -hmm. wear his jersey to yeah. the game. They will oh, yeah. celebrate him when he wins and they will mm -hmm. try to erase him when he becomes yeah. inconvenient. Yes. And that's what these book bans are. Uh, you know, you talk about reading to your students, many of whom had an immigration story and that was their lived experience. You cannot erase the lived experience of immigrants in this country by banning all the books that deal with it. And I believe that is what they're trying to do. They're uncomfortable with something that they see. They're uncomfortable with my queer identity. Guess what? You can ban every show, every book uh, about gay characters, I still exist. Yes, I'm not going anywhere. Right. And, and I think it's the same for our children of color. What's dangerous when we start to talk about children is whether or not they can accept themselves 
if the adults around them don't. And when they cannot accept themselves, we need them to stay alive long enough yes. to become an adult. Yeah. We need gay trans kids to stay alive long enough to be an adult and to know that it gets better. But when you're 12 and you are demonized by the adults in your community, yeah. you are told that the books that represent you are bad. You are told what you internalize is that I am bad. Yeah, absolutely. If, if no one wants to read these books with these people that look like me or have my experience, I must be bad too. Mm -hmm. And so where do they find hope? And it's our job as adults to provide hope and keep these kids alive until they can do it for themselves. Yeah. Layer on to that. And I love the way you put that. Layer on to that for a child of color, and let's say specifically for Black boys who are disproportionately pulled over by cops, arrested, even within our school systems, are being suspended and expelled. We're pulling books out that are have positive images of people who look like them and stories that are inspiring. And the only messages they're receiving, again, I must not I must not be a good person. I must be bad. These are the things that happen to people who look like me. My one big hope, you know, as I think about this and, you know, political science major taught history at the high school level is that we are going down a path that Hitler went um, and that the people who are leading that push will have the same outcome that he did. And the in, in the very end that he eliminated himself um, and that those who surrounded him and supported him have been hunted down across the globe and still being hunted down to this day. That is the one thing that I can hope for. The, the scary thing is that we're banning, we have banned more books than Hitler ever did. More books than Hitler ever did, but he is the big demon in American history. He was the horrible person. He even said that that our racism in this country went too far. <laughs> so, you know, the... Well, <laughs> you know, it, and, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a, for a personal thing for me, right? I, I think about it as a teacher, too, and I know that you do as well. Yeah. How can we, with a straight face, talk about the literacy crisis and then out of the other side of our mouth, ban books that look like more than 50 percent of our population? Yeah. We can't. We, we cannot and sleep with ourselves and feel good um, and be human. We can't. And I think that if you're an educator and you are not speaking out about that, you are allowing yourself to be a, a pawn in some political game that is really doing harm to children all the time. And one of the things that I wrote about in my book, it's like, as teachers, we should take a Hippocratic oath almost like doctors do. And the first thing we should do is make sure that in our instructional practices, in our curriculum, in the way that we teach, the way that we speak to children, that the very first thing we do is to make sure that we do no harm to children. You know, and that that allowing illiteracy and innumeracy to be this disease that plagues children of color, children of low wealth, um, that that is doing harm. It's allowing children to be harmed. And it's not giving a shit, really, about the kids that we're supposed to be taking care of. But Almitra, it's not the teachers making these decisions. The teachers who would have willingly taken that kind of Hippocratic oath, and we all did it in our heart, right? Like, we, we didn't have to do it the way doctors do, but right. we we didn't go into the classroom for fame and money, right? We, we did it. <laughs> Definitely not for money. <laughs> we did it to take care of children. And uh, the people who are influencing this have no idea what it takes to educate a child. None. None. So, uh, and, and I think that's a systemic problem that we have. Why? Why is someone who has no concept of, of reading literacy, a reader's identity, and what that means for lifelong social and economic impact? You know, you, you, you want to talk about um, uh, getting people off welfare and, and who do we demonize uh, in, in terms of of who's on welfare, right? But don't teach a black boy to read. Right. 
right? right? Don't don't provide books that look like that black boy so that he has an experience that, you know, you were on stage at South by Southwest with Alvin mm -hmm. Irby. And I know, I know, uh, I'm a fan of Alvin Irby and his barbershop books. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, his, his uh, theory of change, and I wrote it down for this is early positive and culturally meaningful reading experience cultivate children's reading identity. When mm -hmm. children identify as readers, they read for fun and they perform better. Yeah. And you can extrapolate that if they perform better at school, they yeah. earn more money. When they yeah. earn more money, they buy a house. When they buy a house, they buy, you know what I mean? You, you, you know, you, they pay taxes, they give back to their communities, they help bring others up, they start businesses. They, you know, it's just, it's this balloon effect, right? Um, that or snowball effect that that reaches so many more people. So on the one hand, we demonize, um, but on the other, not and not we, not us on the sure. call and probably not, I'll say 97% of my listeners I only really hear a lot from the 3% who are haters who, you know, send me evil messages and, and nasty threats because um, they have nothing better to do. You don't scare me. I'm still here um, and will be. But this, this, these people who want to and, and, and just continually oppress, it's, it's, and, and sometimes I wonder, are they doing this to this level with this much hatred because they're afraid that when we all get together and take over the world or at least take over the politics in this country and when these children become leaders that we will turn the tables and do to them what they have done to us for so long. I think that to go back to the beginning of our conversation and the intersectionality, that's why intersectional movements are critical, right? I think some of the early queer movements were mm -hmm. exclusive of black and brown uh, members of that same community. Uh, I think feminism has had some missteps in terms Absolutely. of inclusive and still continues to, yeah. um, you know, there, there is, there is a faction of feminism that doesn't accept trans women as women. Um, and uh, so I think that's why intersectionality and, 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 a, and a, an awareness of what privilege I have, as a white mm -hmm. queer woman, but mm -hmm. also where those two identities intersect and, and where all of your identities intersect and where our, our, both of our uh, Venn diagrams uh, <laughs> kind of come together. And yeah. it is, it is a multiplying factor. It, it, it doesn't is. take away from anyone. It multiplies our strength. Yeah. I think if, you know, I, I, you know, was it Rodney King who said, why can't we all get along? And I think if we could get, marginalized groups to realize, you know, we talk about intersectionality, there's this double or triple oppression effect because of those multiple identities that we have. But if we take all of us and put us together, because we are all fighting to be recognized, to be affirmed, to be valued, to be respected, to live our lives in peace, not, you know, no one's doing, these are not the communities that are doing harm to children. Um, but let's us all get together, fight together, and do what's right for kids. And how much more can we accomplish if we're not segmenting? But there is, as I say that, I think there is power in their keeping us from joining forces, right? Um, when you think about the history of this country and how civil rights movements have occurred, and I know we're a little off of intersectionality, but no, this is an intersectionality story. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King was a bad guy, according to the old white men in power in D.C., um, and it was okay because he was only dealing with Black people, and it was only for a long time, only Jewish people that were white that helped support him. Mm -hmm. But when it became that civil rights movement that also included a poor people's movement and poor white people joined forces, oh no, they had to shut that down, right? So when we realize that together we are much stronger, I think that we can do more. And those voices that can support the children in our schools and getting rid of these bands um, that are, you know, it, uh, I get a little ticked off 
but it's a few parents that are screaming and calling it parent rights. I'm sorry. And when I look at, at, at especially large urban school districts that are 60, 70, and 80% students of color, then those 80% of parents who are of color, they should be the ones that are screaming for their rights, for their children to have access to books that affirm and value who they are. And include into that 80% queer parents who are white or children who are white and queer, add their parents to that. And we have the masses to say, this is not right. And we're not going to stand for it. We've got to do it at the, at the ballot box too. Absolutely. Which takes me to my third topic, yes. which is uh, politicos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a, we had a fun chat about that one, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this whole demonization of race and identity that is coming from the political world. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there's some fear. I think there's, there is, uh, I think there's a little bit of fear of, of this, this really silly concept of replacement, like, if we give everybody room, then what about me? I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get replaced, right? I think yeah. some of the sort things of white that, male fragility kind no. of thing. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the label for it, right? Yeah. Um, the whole make America great. At, when? What are we <laughs> trying? When was it great? Like, yeah, I thought yeah. we were it we was, were working towards great, right. and now it we was have taken. Great it was great back in the 40s and 50s when it was all old white men that were in control and women and black and brown people and Asian people and queer people had zero power. That's the again they want to go back to. Right. So I think there's that fear of that replacement, right? That fear that I am now outnumbered. We always have been, by the way. Um, <laughs> if we were really intersectional, you always have been, guys. Mm -hmm. Um I think some of the things that we used to that used to have to stay in the dark are now being said out in the light of day. And I think that is moving some of this. And then you and I talked about self-hatred and yeah. um, is there, there are, there are some folks when I hear political pundits or, or politicians or people at school boards, when I hear them, um, pastors in the pulpit, when I uh -huh. hear them railing against certain identities, uh, sometimes I hear hatred mm -hmm. uh, for otherness. And sometimes mm -hmm. I hear a little bit of hatred, hatred for myself. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I, I told you, I came, I came out late in life. I had that. And I had that, mm -hmm. that experience of not wanting to accept that, not feeling okay, feeling the way I felt. Um, I was involved in church. I led youth group. Um, mm. And you talk about wanting to do no harm and the regrets that I have uh, in, in my time in front of kids who probably had some, some kids who were dealing with queer identity. Um, and I towed that I towed that company line and, and I have regrets about that, yeah. but my towing of that line and my inability to be fully accepting the way the Jesus that I was taught and that I was trying to teach, uh, would have accepted is if you believe in that kind of thing, uh, I lost my train of thought there, but, but, but it was, I couldn't have that acceptance because I couldn't accept myself. Yeah. I couldn't tell a kid it was okay to be gay because it wasn't okay for me to be gay. Mm -hmm. um, and that took a very long time and I lost a lot in that. And, and I hear some of that fear and self-hatred in some of the ways people talk about it. Yeah. So, you know, I was taught growing up in church, um, that God hates this, hates the sin, but loves the sinner. So if you believe it's a sin, that's fine. That's behavioral, but that person is still a person and it's still a child of God. You know, if you're of the Christian faith, every person is a child of God. So rather than take away every bit of their identity, why not just love them? You know, yeah. I just, I, I don't, I don't get it. But again, it is these same 
I want to say Bible thumpers. So I'm going to say Bible thumpers, this, this group of people who profess to be Christian, but are not, um, who are banning books about people of color. So if racism is in your heart, it's there. And that's for you to deal with, with your God. Um, and that's not to say that any one God is better than another God. You know, your choice of religious, we do live in a country that professes to have, professes to have religious freedom. Um, it is on the books. And I support people in believing whatever they believe as long as you don't hurt children. And Listen, we're if, talking if, about if you're going to have a microphone, if you have a microphone in the pulpit, uh, on the on the house floor, uh, on television, if you have a microphone and you use that microphone to tell a child, uh, a child me, a child version of me that that there's something wrong with me, I better not hear about you tapping your foot under the bathroom stall <laughs> in another in another news cycle. Absolutely. And how much of that have we seen? <sighs> a lot. A lot. The foot tapper. I think that was the original. Wasn't he the oh, original that was, one? That Yeah, that was. It was. And I can't remember who it was. And it was so I long ago. But it was the first big one that got blown yeah. out of the water. And several yeah. have I, since then. You know? Yeah, I think that was the early 80s. That was the 90s. I was a teenager. Was it the 90s? Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm much older than you. <laughs> so... I always sign off with this paraphrase from Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis, who I always say is one of my early sheroes. Um, she said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. So what is the thing that you cannot accept on this topic? And what can my listeners do to support that change? Um, I think I said it a little, I, I cannot accept that we will talk about the crisis of literacy and illiteracy, and then out of the other side of our mouth, prevent children from creating an identity of being a reader. And uh, what I did uh, to support that was, um, yes. uh, so you see my read the rainbow and it has the inclusive queer uh, flag, which includes black, brown, trans. It's, uh, it's the, the, the more inclusive uh, rainbow flag. Um, the company Kind Cotton was founded by an educator in Florida. Uh, for every shirt that she sells, she puts a book in the hands of a child. And so if not everyone can do that, not everyone can afford, uh, if you can um, buy a shirt, she sends boxes of books to classrooms, she sends books to children. Um, if you can't donate any amount that you can, three dollars one dollar you can donate to drag story time which is a 50c3 uh which is uh, has chapters all over the country re with, with drag queens uh all drag identities reading stories to children i also love yes Barbershop. not just queens but drag kings as well if so we're going drag, to be inclusive okay and and drag non-binaries okay <laughs> um and then bar it, or barbershop books uh dr alvin irby uh, you know supporting specifically uh, black and brown boys in, in communities. Any one of those uh, would be a, a great way to put books in front of kids. And uh, I think that that's, that's the hill I'll die on. Let's put, okay. books, let's put books in their hands. Okay. And we're going to put that link down in the show notes so people will be able to at least start down the path there. We'll make sure that that happens. And Alvin is actually going to be a guest on the show. I think he is up next. I'd have to look at calendar, but I think Alvin is up next. We had a little scheduling challenge, but uh, he is going to be on this show. I'll Just to remind fan girl, I'll yeah, become become fan girl that session. Absolutely. Just a reminder, folks, if you're hearing this for the first time on an audio podcast, all episodes will be coming to you first via live stream. So if you are not subscribed to my YouTube channel, if you do not follow me on social media, check down in the show notes for those links, subscribe, turn on notifications, and of course, share and spread the word. Heather, we've got your contact information. It's going to be down in the show notes. You have, I think, helped to create such a brave space on a topic that's affecting so many people in our schools. And I'm hoping that our parents, um, our educators are listening and deciding to no longer accept 
what's happening with book bans and the, the impact on black and brown and queer children. And to the rest of you equity warriors out there, if you or someone you know is an everyday equity warrior doing amazing things, please let me know. You can YouTube chat me. You can DM me on LinkedIn. You can leave a voicemail on 3epodcast.com. Whatever it is, send up a smoke signal. Just get me the message. I'll continue to bring you awesome and inspiring guests. And maybe you or someone you know should be one of them. Remember to like, share, subscribe. And as always, don't worry about the things you cannot change. Change the things you can no longer accept. And I'll see you next time. 